Welcome to Reverse Engineering News. I'm your host, Hash. Thanks for joining. This week, we're going to look at some in-depth reverse engineering of a Milwaukee M18 battery, an open source motorized XY stage for microscopes, and dialects. They're not just for language, apparently. They're also for protocols. But first, Rich Essam has a Patreon. Follow the link in the description to subscribe to it there. There's more in-depth information in each show like this, and a little Patreon icon up in the corner so you know when the extra content is rolling. The videos are ad-free, and it's a great way to support the channel. Now on to the show. So reverse engineering Milwaukee M18 batteries. It appears to have started on a website called Quagmire Repair. There, you'll see a teardown of the batteries, the circuit board taken out, the circuit board sanded down so you could see each one of the layers, all the parts removed from the board, and a schematic created. Quite a bit of work done there just to get an overall layout of the whole battery itself and how it was assembled. Then he started to look at the protocol a bit, capture some information. The battery apparently talks to the charger and there's a whole negotiation back and forth. He captured some of that data and with the help of somebody else, it looks like they figured out the checksum that's used when the data is sent back and forth. The checksum is important to authenticate the data and to also send your own packets and and the, that way each side knows if the packet was good or not. Now another person, tool scientist, appears to have perhaps started there and then taken the research quite a bit further when it comes to looking at the protocol and actually figuring out how it works, what all the various parts are, and how to trigger different things. So like over temperature alarms and under temperature alarms and over current and under current. I mean, a whole ton of stuff was done. It's a great video. It's a good, uh, guy's got a good sense of humor and you'll see that and how he explains the protocol and how the things communicate back and forth. Now he logged the data with a logic analyzer and one of the things that both of the different groups noticed was that the, it's a kind of an odd baud rate. It's like 2000 bits per second. Normally things are at 2400 or 48 or 96, uh, you know, it's a whole kind of standard for RS-232 and serial protocols. This apparently doesn't conform to that and they don't need to. They're talking to their own devices. And so perhaps because of a cheaper clock frequency or just using the clock frequency they had, uh, they stuck with 2000 bits per second. Now, it seems like there's a very close similarity to the printer ink cartridge marriage, you could say. Printer manufacturers, when they make them, want you to buy their ink cartridges. And so they go to great lengths to put secure microcontrollers and things like that in the ink cartridges so that they talk to the printer and it will only use cartridges from the original manufacturer. Now, people figure out ways to reverse engineer those and sell aftermarket cartridges. That's completely legal uh, to sell aftermarket things that can fit into a device and to even reverse engineer it. But they go to great lengths, these printer manufacturers, to prevent that. It doesn't seem like the, the battery market, the tool market, has gotten that far. Uh, but I'm sure they aspire to what the printer manufacturers are doing. So I would beware of any internet connected tools, chargers, anything like that, because it starts to open the door for firmware updates and other things where they can recognize batteries and whether it's a third party battery or not. Just recently in the digital camera market, there was an upgrade for a Sony camera. And apparently when that upgrade was applied, the batteries, aftermarket batteries, the functionality of them in the camera wasn't the same as it was prior to the firmware update. So that can definitely happen. It's a thing. It's happened with printer cartridges as well. Now let's talk about this motorized XY stage that Boris put together. He's got it on his website. He breaks down all the various pieces and parts that are involved in making it. Uh, it's a digitally controlled platform uh, that he's using to image silicon wafers from microchips. You could use it to image anything. Basically what it is is a stage that can move in the X and the Y direction, and it's digitally controlled. So when you're trying to take very high resolution images of microchips, you zoom in very tightly with the microscope, and you take a bunch of pictures, and then you stitch it together. And so the movement of that, I mean, it could be hundreds or a thousand pictures of a tiny little silicon wafer, is tedious. 
And so there's these XY stages that people will build or that companies sell. There's various microscope manufacturers out there as well that that sell professional automated versions of this. So his write-up is great that he has on his site. I mean, he gives you things like the bill of materials, uh, 3D printable parts that are used to kind of hold the whole thing together, whether it's couplings that are used or motor mounts. And he really shows you kind of all the pieces you need to build this XY stage. The XY stage itself is a piece that you buy. It's available on Amazon for about $100 and eBay for 50 and AliExpress for around 30 something, but about 50 once you factor in shipping. He uses stepper motors to control this XY stage. So very similar to like an open source 3D printer where you'd kind of move a platform around. This is just moving a very small platform around that you slap on top of your microscope. It's interesting is he chose to use uh, drive shafts, it looks like, uh, that are used for radio controlled cars to connect the XY stage uh, little rotating parts, like that kind of the piece of what looks like a micrometer, to the stepper motor. Now he has Arduino code published as well that controls this whole setup and has various inputs you can give to it. One, one interesting piece that you'll see if you read it, it's kind of buried in the middle of the page there, but he came up with a cool way to only control one motor at a time. So only one motor at a time can be powered on, which means you can use a much smaller power supply because you're not having to drive these three stepper motors at a time. And so I say three stepper motors because you use two to drive the XY stage. And then you have one that you have to drive the focus so that you can control the focus as it's moved around and really create a map of where does it need to be focused based on the, the level of the different corners of the the piece that you're looking at. You should definitely check out his site. The silicon images he has on there are, are amazing. The detail's fantastic. And so you can tell that it's a very high quality microscope and just a very high quality job uh, that he's doing when he images these things. Now on to protocol dialects. There's something that I didn't even know existed and I'm going to explain it to you because once I did kind of really grasp it, it was incredibly interesting. So I happened upon some old talks um, by a guy named Sergey Bratis. Now with the protocol dialects, what he showed is that uh, when you have a very complex protocol, say something like uh, 802.11 or 802.15.4 for Zigbee, there's so many different fields and there's so many different combinations of data that can be in those fields that various manufacturers don't implement every possible permutation of data that could come across. And so why does that matter? That matters because you can transmit a packet of information. If you build up the whole packet and you send it out from your transmitter that say something from one manufacturer will respond to, but another manufacturer won't. And so he built this matrix chart of basically all the permutations of how you could send data and how various devices respond to that data. And the very cool thing he realized is that even with just this, you could send a packet of information and you could determine what, like who made the device by whether it responds or not. It's very interesting in that you could really fingerprint and identify devices or people based on the products you know that they might have and how they respond. And so as opposed to say using a directional antenna where I just try to send the energy to a device I know and I hope the other devices don't hear, this is like send out the energy to every single device, but the packet was crafted in a way that only one device would respond. And so he calls that like a protocol having a dialect meaning that if you say it a certain way, only certain devices will respond. You're able to figure these things out because the hardware we need, the tools we need to do this level of experimentation are available. So what he says is that he quotes this guy, his name was Joshua Wright. Security does not improve until practical tools for exploration of the attack surface are made available. And so that means if there aren't tools that we can use to test something, it's likely not secure. 
it's, I mean, it, you know, if you're going to bet one way or the other, if something's secure, if you're going to look at wireless protocols, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, things where the tools exist, and then you're going to contrast that to other things like smart meters and private developed networks and protocols where no public tools exist, you can say one of those is probably more secure than the other. Now, if you like this, the longer version is available on Patreon. You should go over there and subscribe, support the channel, and check out the ad-free, in-depth version of this news show. Now, you can find me on Twitter. I'm just going to keep calling it Twitter. I like Twitter better than X. It just rolls off the tongue better. You can also find me on Instagram, and I'm over in Discord. Discord has well over a thousand people at this point, and a lot of good conversation about reverse engineering and projects that people are working on. I encourage you to join in there and ask about things you might want to reverse engineer or just listen in to what other people are talking about. There's a lot of smart people in there uh, discussing how they're doing things. And create a page on the wiki and share stuff you're working on. I mean, maybe you have a blog, maybe you share stuff on the blog. Uh, the challenge I find with reverse engineering is that a lot of people have blogs and sites with information on them but there isn't a centralized place. That's why I created the wiki. Some spot, even if you want to just create a page that is just a high level reference to what you're working on and link back to your blog, that's fine. It's just nice to have a spot where we can go and take a look at things and, and find them easily. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next week.